Okay, so I often get asked about, uh, first of all, how to do prototyping, and of course, I've put a bunch of stuff online uh, for how to do that at judepullen.com slash designmodeling. But I also thought I'd just uh, give a shout out to this book by Bjarki Hal Grimson and uh, Prototyping and Model Making for Product Design. Really good primer on the basics of how to get started. Um, secondly, Rob Thompson, I kind of feel is like the product designer, industrial designer's Bible on manufacturing processes. If you feel like you didn't quite know what it was, but were too afraid to ask, just fantastic. Uh, at essentially the formula I really like of generally speaking, a uh, bit of a technical breakdown of what's going on and then real life photos. And then finally, there's this beast here which is really getting into the real world design for manufacture and assembly. So I'm not going to go blow by blow for it, but I think actually understanding the full journey makes more sense of why, dare I say it, some decisions are made when you are a graduate and you're in a professional situation and you can't understand why they're going to do this thing that's really beautiful, but is extremely hard to assemble uh, in manufacturing and assembly lines. So having that real world basis um, hopefully won't be a constraint on creativity, but rather a reason to push back and think laterally to make sure that it doesn't fall foul of those constraints. So, kicking off with prototyping and model making. So, here we have it. And I think what's great about this book is even though I didn't necessarily use this uh, as sort of, should we say, my introduction to prototyping, I was kind of quite obviously a bit into it before I got to this. Um, it's, it's fair to say that this is still a really good primer that I recommend to people. And the key thing is it says how prototypes are used. And you see that this is just, you know, quick and dirty modeling. There's a bit of Lego or connects there, just little bits of foam and things like that and paper along with explanatory sketches. And I think it's just that key thing that you're testing a bunch of different things here. And this is like a dog ball thrower and trying everything from a catapult to a throwing stick and of course seeing how well the end user be it the human or dog appreciates the result and at the end of the day i think that's what the whole point of prototyping is uh, for good user experience at the end of the day that's what it's all about so again another thing without laboring it too much uh chances are at the beginning of your career you think you're invincible and you don't worry about a ton of stuff but you don't want to wake up and find that Oh, right, I never knew that X, like coal dust, asbestos, MDF, you know, was a health hazard uh, until you got to the age of 50 and then you realize it's done irreparable damage. So whenever possible, just be a bit aware of, you know, things like fumes and particles, noise and risks of things, you know, flying off and hitting you. So again, going into, you know, how to do things with adhesives and fillers, how to sculpt, why it matters to sort of observe certain, you know, principles of design. It brings together not just putting any old radii you feel on it, why it's good to maybe harmonize and just pick one or two radii for a piece to give it a more harmonious look. And I think that's, that's one of the nice things about this book. It explains not just how to do it, but why you do it. And I think another one is that it has a few, you know, good examples, like a little kid's walkie talkie. And I think this is a great one to say it might have started off in, car, uh, in CAD or as an illustrator sketch, but then printing these out and sticking it on a chunk of foam, as you can see, this is how they've worked out the, 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 the general look and feel of something. And it becomes pretty apparent that your, th your thumb or your finger can't reach a button or it's too big in the kid's hands or too small or, you know, they're always dropping on here and it gets broken. So even though this is foam, maybe you've got to worry about that in the end product. All those sorts of things are just fantastically useful to test. Um, and I think most people aren't sort of sniffy about the fact it's a prototype. I think if anything, most people find it pretty cute and fun to engage with it and have a bit of a sort of imagination on, oh yeah, this would be so cool if it was like this and like that. So strangely, a prototype sometimes gets you more interesting creative feedback than you might suspect. Actually, when you present the final thing, the, the human nature is to say, mm, yeah, it's good, it's perfect, don't worry about it, even if they're quietly thinking, yeah, I hate it and I'll never buy it. So, you know, hard one advice, definitely always go prototype if you can, even if you know what the final one should or could look like. Um, 
Again, I think this is great to show the progression of moving out of just all the sketches into the 3D. It becomes very apparent whether these handles are in fact too chunky or uncomfortable or just maybe a good for men and not good for women or not good for children. All of those things get drawn out in the process and people are terrible at articulating themselves. So it's better to just observe them because they'll sometimes say it's fine when clearly it's not. So again, I think another thing that I really love is looking at other industries. And this is a nice example of how um, essentially the automotive industry uses clay for sculpting and then 3D scans it um, for CAD. Now, I've never actually done this. I've never worked in automotive. Uh, yeah. And, and then what's interesting about this is that when you scan it, it I was aware of this process. And so when I was scanning, um, someone's arm which was missing some of their fingers due to a birth defect and we were looking at creating a prosthetic I wouldn't have thought of using a 3d scanner had I not been aware of this process and so I think it's always incredibly helpful to look at the holistic picture of all the different prototyping things you can you know witness or get some exposure to especially in your uh, undergraduate studies because it just really lays the foundation for a lot of the future and again, I think one of the things that you might find if you join an agency or a company is that you don't always get to do the sort of the silly, messy things and, you know, quite literally be a student. So if you want to know whether you want to do things like moulding, whether this looks fun, the best time to do it is when you've got a university workshop rather than having to try and convince your boss in a company to buy a vacuum former and a bunch of silicons when you don't even know whether you're any good at it. Uh, or what the limitations are. So it's much more compelling if you can say, look, I've done this, check out my folio, uh, please can I buy this because I wanna help the project by doing this particular process or prototype. Um, it's infinitely more powerful to have some prior experience. So whether you get that off your own initiative or by doing some freelance work or working in a workshop as a technical assistant over a summer holiday or something, I cannot recommend it strongly enough. Even if you spend a lot of time in CAD, or sketching, you know, that experience is always underpinned by hard one experience, um, prototyping and working with the end user. So that's that. <clears throat> then I think, um, dare I say it, let's, let's sort of start from this one. Um, Rob Thompson's Manufacturing Processes for Design Professional. I think this is just, you know, I mean, this is often referred to as the Bible uh, by people in the early stage of their career and indeed a little bit later on, I think, in that it just goes through this really lovely format and it's got these color coordinated sections here. And it starts off with, for example, a case study showing what it is, how it works. And then as you can see, it moves into sort of diagrams of, of, of explaining exactly uh, how it works and sometimes the pros and cons. So it hasn't got it for each of them, but it breaks it down into like why this is a good idea or why there's limitations and then prompt you to look at other processes up here, um, which might be more appropriate. So for example, rotational modeling has some benefits, has some, has some downsides as well with it. And then I think even things that you take for granted like machine glass blowing, uh, it's one thing to see a person on a craft, uh, you know, batch process as opposed to a fully automated mechanized process. And so I think it's, it's really interesting to understand both of those journeys and design considerations. And in many ways, I think, uh, you know, I find myself a bit, it's a bit of a nerdy thing, but whenever I picked up a new piece of packaging, I'm always drawn to like, how did they make it? And how did they bring the whole experience together? And it, it's things like this book that really give you an insight into that journey um, of the design process. And so I think things that you take for granted, egg boxes, paper pulp packaging, Again, I think when you draw stuff up, you think, oh, it's just going to be a press. But actually, it's got a whole load of different ways of approaching this from putting holes that suck it, some push it and squeeze it. There's all sorts of different considerations. So even something as humble as an egg box is actually, you know, quite a refined and exact process um, in order to get those costs. And indeed, I think that's a really nice thing that the, the book doesn't give you a price quote um, but it does give you quite often a, a link to a company that either produced the end product or does the manufacturing process that it's describing. And I think we've gone from egg boxes to, you know, designer lessy plates. 
and I think it's it's very obvious that you know there's the, the what you're getting with that extra money is also you know a little bit down to the design that's going into it and so how to justify that extra cost in the end result I think is a thin red thread that goes through this book that I think it's really helpful you know at the beginning of your design career that if you want a fancy process at the end of the day someone's got to pay for it um, there's then things which I think are just straight up industry standards that you don't always get taught at university or if you do it's just in a textbook but again I think what's great about things like ultrasonic welding is it really does go into the detail of you know how all the different sort of horns and things like that work what are the limitations showing issues that come up when it's imperfect or whatever and I think this is just you know you're getting as close as you can to going for a visit and of course, then when you're watching, say, Googling this and looking on a YouTube video, it all starts to come together. Um, <clears throat> again, it sort of breaks out into other sort of processes. You can see we're in the yellow section here. Um, and this is sort of some really quite unusual things like uh, hydro transfer printing. So essentially floating uh, a decal in a tank, which then wraps around, in this case, uh, a weapon and gives it this weird camouflage look, which is, you know, impressive on a technical level, if slightly chilling in its real world application. Um, so nonetheless, uh, I think it's just one of those things that just has a wealth of really great uh, examples. And I think more so than, than many other books, it, it really has examples which I feel stand the test of time um, in terms of, you know, things like nickel plating still has a, you know, huge role um, in industrial product design, um, having used it even at Dyson. So again, the big heavy one. Uh, this one, one does not buy this book lightly. Uh, it hasn't even got the price on it. It's that expensive. Uh, I think I ended up paying oh, something like uh, £45 for it, and I know that it can go up to 70 So this is this is really serious. But I'd say I bought this because... I was getting to the stage in my career where I needed to make decisions about why we did things in a certain way for manufacture and assembly. And even though I wasn't necessarily on the shop floor telling people what to do, I was having to close that gap between my ignorance and what was quick and effective to implement. And so I think this book really helped me in, in so many ways get there a little bit closer. And I thought I'd just show you that it, it has a, I'd say, dare I say it, even if you didn't buy the book for all the ridiculously intense um, <laughs> information, I think it's got an incredibly good introduction that really sort of, you know, gives a little bit of humility and perspective to the role of a designer um, as part of the whole process. And there's this great picture, which I think is pretty, is pretty legendary now, which is <clears throat> the role of who casts the bigger shadow. And as you can see, the product designer casts a massive shadow. And what it means by that is the effect of a product designer making a mistake. How much does it have an impact on everything else? Whereas actually the, the material cost and the labor, there's, there's relatively little stress if it goes wrong. So it's one of those things that should we say philosophically becomes a big thing. And another um, little illustration it has is, is essentially the overwall over the wall sort of uh, way of doing business that designers on the left just chuck over the drawings and the poor engineer is just left to get on with it and build it. And of course, the truth is that that is completely unacceptable. And I think that was uh, certainly dead, if not on the way out when I started. And I think you just find it, you know, you just look a very ignorant designer if you simply hoped that someone could manufacture something that was untoolable. So that is not to limit creativity <clears throat> in any way, but it's just to say going in there with not just swagger, but actually some knowledge can really mean that your your, your ideas stand the chance of going through to, to being products. <clears throat> and I think, again, without getting too much into it, it's uh, just little sort of reality checks of, you know, do, you know, do you have an ugly baby? And of course, no one's going to tell the mum that way. So I think the book is really not about saying... Do, does does my mum and my dad like my design or even my co-worker it's about really trying to take agency and and know whether that you've got a well-designed product yourself and of course this is very manufacturing heavy but actually a lot of the you know just because user-centered design often refers to the end user 
let's be fair about this. User-centered design should be applied to good manufacturing and assembly. If you're just because you're chucking this over to China or Malaysia or whatever, doesn't mean that you want to put someone in a position where at the end of the day, they're, they're suffering a problem with their hands because it's so difficult to assemble what you designed. So I think, you know, design doesn't really just, you know, only focus on the bit that uh, it's all about the Amazon reviews. What's it like for the person who's got to work in a factory assembling this all day? So, yeah, from the, from the front cover, it gives some interesting sort of provocations of saying you might want to make this little uh, stainless steel bracket. And it just sort of brings down the point that on the left hand side, you might be able to make it cheaper from two parts that require less process, but it requires you to assemble it and some adjustment is necessary. The plus side is that if you do the other one, yep, you don't have the assembly uh, and indeed you don't have to have two processes, but of course the tolerance has to be higher because you can't adjust those screws to make sure it's going to fit. And of course it doesn't say this is the right or the wrong answer. You need to decide based on the particular product you're doing. Um, and indeed, what are the tolerances that you can afford to give this so that it works? I mean, obviously, if you take something like Apple, it's using statistical tolerancing. Whereas if you're designing, say, a little bit of farm machinery and you expect someone's going to go in and fiddle with it, then probably something that's a bit self-serviceable is a better choice. So again, there is no right answer, but it goes through all these considerations of what is the actual process to getting a piece of wire to connect to a component? You know, I mean, some of these things I deliberately point out are dated. You know, we're not using through hole components so much. It's more surface mount and reflowing. But the point is the, 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 the understanding of how things come together is still really important. And even if a third party is saying we're going to take care of it, having some understanding of where you could get a high amount of risk or you need to create redundancy in a circuit, that's really going to help you. Again, I feel there's some basics which this book doesn't cover for the sake of brevity, but getting into some really detailed understanding of how machining works and, you know, the realities of how things are actually going to be uh, machined when they get on the factory floor, I think is incredibly useful. So again, tables of like yield strengths for different plastics. I appreciate you can Google it, but dare I say it, there's definitely been times where you're just wanting to understand the, the, the discussion beforehand rather than just look up the number. And I think this is where sometimes books can outrank Google in that Google will just tell you the number, but this preamble will give you considerations of why certain plastics are more preferable on balance of many considerations, be it cost, be it time, be it even hazards or recyclability. So I think, again, going blow by blow exactly what an injection mold looks like to a much higher level of detail than this. Um, and again, various processes and pros and cons of that. So I appreciate these are pretty, you know, we've gone all the way through from the basics to the, to the heavyweight stuff. But I feel that between these books, um, if you're intending to work physically with prototypes and you're responsible for managing uh, how things turn out on the production line, I think these cover all the bases and really set you up. Um, so I hope that's useful. Thanks again. Bye.